So hi everyone, my name is Andrea Torres. I work in the student recruitment team. And today is my pleasure to be with my colleagues for uh, hosting this webinar, Seeking New Opportunities, Innovate Global Partners and Partnerships. Um, I just want to let you know everyone that we will be recording this session. And I'm very grateful to have sharing this room with my colleagues and, and thank you for all of the work that they have been doing to make this day possible. Uh, during this session, we highly recommend you to have your audio turn off. However, there's going to be a space for us in the breakout rooms to share um, all the information and connect. So at that time, I highly recommend you um, to use your microphone and you're more than welcome to have your video on during the whole session. Um, we also know that sounds better, uh, would be better once you have um, like a head um, a headphone, uh, however we know, um, a headset, however we know all of you might not be able to access one of those, so, but if you have one, please feel free to use it. We also want to make sure that you can use the chat to connect with us, you can use, raise your hand if you have any questions or comments, you can use uh, the different reactions that is in the corner, um, on the right corner of your page. Uh, so feel free to use all those um, gestures to connect and communicate with all, with all of us. Um, you have the option to have a speaker view um, or a gallery view. So please feel free to choose the one that fits better um, so you can see the PowerPoint as well as the people that are in this session. If you haven't updated your name at this time, I highly recommend you, you update your name. At Royal Roach University, we like to call everybody by your name and we want to create that connectivity. Uh, so if you can use your first name and last name or just the name that you prefer um, as to use to connect with you during this session. Uh, here is the different, uh, the chat, the raise your hand and the reaction that I was talking about. And if at any point you experience any tech um, challenge during the session, I have my colleague Christy Jones that is going to be keeping an eye on the um, chat box and making sure that you can provide support and help everyone. Uh, from experience, we know people will have a better experience when you come through the app versus when you come from the browser. And I can see a lot of people are already sharing some information in the chat box. So welcome everybody. It's very exciting to see people join us from different cities across Canada, Toronto, Whistler. So welcome everyone. Uh, with that said, I just want to acknowledge that Royal Roach University lives, learns, and works on the traditional land of the Quasanto and the Lacuancan families, and we are very grateful to be able to share this territory with them. Um, so the agenda for today is we are going to welcome and provide some introductions. After that, we are going to talk about Albert, Alberta Innovates, the background and introduction to the global partnership. Uh, we are going to have an overview of research project on the International Innovation Partnership in Asia and Latin, and Latin America. And then we are going to be uh, moving to the breakout groups discussions that will be lead by Daryl, Sheila and Charles. And then we will come back in the group, main group and we will report back of those conversations that we had during the uh, breakout rooms. So with that said, I would like to pass over to my colleagues so they can introduce yourself and welcome everyone. Hi, since I'm top of the list, I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Sheila Carruthers. I am a fellow certified management consultant and I lead a boutique um, agency on, called CSR Strategies in Calgary, Alberta. I'm proud to be a Royal Roads MBA alumnus and um, excited that I will shortly begin teaching in the um, MBA program in the management consulting specialization. So that's me. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Daryl Williams, uh, working with uh, Albert Innovates. Uh, I I'm also a Royal Roads uh, MBA alumni and um, generally have held uh, a lot of management experience, uh, senior management experience in a number of different uh, companies and have worked uh, throughout the globe um, for the, about the last 25 years or so. Thank you, Daryl. And I know our colleague Charles have been having some issues this morning with, um, with technology. Uh, so in the meantime, he comes back. I'm just going to introduce Charles. 
I think he's just back right now. Um, so I'm going to give him a second, but uh, Charles has been, he's a professor and the program head uh, of their MBA program at Royal Welch University. And he leads the School of Business, International Business and Trade Courses and works at the research in Asia and Europe. Um, so Charles, I don't I'm know. Just back. You are back, welcome back. I just did a brief introduction, but feel free to share any information with those that are in the session with us today. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you covered it and that I've been with Royal Roads quite a while. I teach uh, economics, environmental economics and international. And now I'm MBA program head. And so we're doing some things. And at the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the MBA program and some of the changes and innovations we're doing, both because of the times and just to keep the program as well uh, relevant and, and some of the exciting new areas and specializations that we're offering. Daryl, you want to, you're ready to jump in? I am. Um, so it's uh, Daryl Williams from Albert Innovates. I'm going to give you a little uh, background um, about uh, Albert Innovates and a little bit about uh, global partnerships and what we do. So Alberta Innovates is a, a, an agency owned in, um, by the Alberta government. Uh, we have about 558 employees. Um, about 400 of them are, are very, uh, uh, can you go back please? Back, thanks. Uh, about four, 400 of them are scientists and technologists. Um, we've been um, through a number of different name changes over the, the last few years, I think a few years ago called Alberta Research Council. But Alberta Innovates also captures a much wider and broader um, a set of um, uh, skills and, and areas of focus that we have. And we're really Alberta's innovation engine. So we work with uh, small, medium and large companies to help them uh, diversify Alberta's company, or diversify Alberta's economy, um, to help grow Alberta uh, economically, create jobs and uh, uh, really, we work with a number of, uh, in the area where, where I work under entrepreneurial investments, we work with a number of small and medium enterprise to really start and nurture them uh, to be able to, to focus and grow. And we provide uh, coaching, we provide con, con, um, content, and uh, we provide connections for them to, to meet the people that they need to make their businesses successful. So in, you know, to put things in perspective a bit, uh, a lot of small uh, and medium enterprise uh, really go through um, a different cycle when they're starting up. And under our, our umbrella group of entrepreneurial investments, we work with small and medium enterprise from the state when they're sort of committing to, to become a company and, and starting to look at how do they validate their technology, how to scale, and move up and grow and then establish themselves as a larger company. So we have programs that work all through that continuum, different funding, different coaching, uh, and certainly different connections for them. And they can be anywhere, uh, you know, from uh, uh, technology companies, they can be artificial intelligence companies, uh, clean tech and companies. There's, there's a, a wide variety of companies that we serve. Uh, the area that I work in is what's called global partnerships. And we have a, a number of programs uh, that we call uh, international technology partnerships. Uh, and we work with Alberta small and medium enterprise. And a small and medium enterprise is any company that's under 500 employees and under 50 million in revenue per year. And what we do is we provide um, avenues where they can do joint technology development leading to commercialization, so commercialization of a product or service that they're looking at, and addressing defined market needs. So there needs to be market pull. It needs to be a, a product or service that the market is willing to pay for. Currently, we work in six areas, uh, three in Mexico, or sorry, three in China and two in Mexico. Um, and we're looking at, uh, looking at a new area. 
And we're also looking at new regions. So our current programs are um, run usually once a year. Uh, we take Alberta companies to, to various regions in our programs. We do matchmaking, we find them partners, we do soft landing. We help create an atmosphere for them that has trusted connections and connections with people that not only ourselves uh, as a government entity can uh, validate, but also our partner um, uh, governments that we work with. Um, so uh, the next slide, please. <coughs> so the slides are, um, are jumping around a bit. Um, so where we sit in Alberta Innovates with global partnerships, we really feel that uh, working with other partnerships in other countries can help um, really go through the, the validating of, of uh, technology. And it helps accelerate technology uh, development for Alberta companies and even the the companies that we partner with, say, for example, in, in Mexico and in Jalisco, in which is our longest running program, which has been running for about nine years now, we've had a, an extreme amount of successful companies. Uh, we've had companies that, that have met up with a partner in, in, say, Guadalajara, and that partner has taken them into Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. Uh, they've, one company in particular now has um, uh, Mercedes as a, as a client, has uh, Lazy Boy, has a number of different uh, Fortune 500 companies. And partnering is, is a key strength to the international uh, programs and also the ability to uh, scale and grow within that uh, by finding a partner makes that certainly faster. And we found that a lot of companies that grow internationally usually double their revenue uh, within um, a shorter period of time, usually twice as fast as companies that don't. And the, the program really facilitates that. And I think actually Melissa Ferrero, I saw her name pop up on the, on the session. Uh, she's one of the key people in the Alberta office in, uh, in Guadalajara. And uh, the Alberta offices, I think there's about 10 10 or 12 around the world, those are very key for anybody looking at that sort of growing and moving past the, at least the borders of Alberta. And they also complement a lot of the other uh, contacts and resources that are there, uh, with, includes the Canadian Trade Commissioners, etc. So why do companies really go global? Um, really to reduce their dependency on, on domestic markets, um, improve their financial ec economic performance, uh, longer term uh, sustainability, certainly more growth opportunities. Uh, using Alberta as an example, uh, where there's about 4 million people, uh, I always say uh, there's a lot of villages out there that are 4 million people now in, in a lot of countries. And it's, certainly a, a much broader markets in, in other countries. Um, they get to recover their investments quicker um, and also globalize their products. And a quick example, we had a company that we were working with just outside of Edmonton, a logistics tracking company. And uh, we took them to uh, Guadalajara. They met with a logistics company and they said, well, we like your technology, but we have other issues here. You know, we have issues where uh, we may have a product that's hijacked on roads that we don't have cell service. How can you help us out? So they took and redesigned some of their product to fit uh, a market. And really, when you look at uh, markets in North America, per se, uh, U.S. and Canada, they're fairly simple, similar. But when you get outside of that, there are other potential issues that you really need to look at how you're globalizing your products and what you're taking into account. And one size does not necessarily fit all. Uh, also increased sales, uh, collaboration. Uh, I'm a real strong proponent on companies collaborating and partnering, and, and that's a really quick way to win, a quick way to grow. 
uh, access to talent. Uh, I think I have an, uh, on another slide, but just quickly, uh, you know, working in the Lisco program, for example, our companies are just blown away by the, the, the quality of the talent and the, the amount of talent. And I think that uh, if you look, say, even in Alberta and probably the same in BC or Ontario, you're looking at probably uh, uh, about 5,000, maybe to 6,000 6, ICT grads a year in all the, all the tech schools and universities. Uh, Jalisco has access to 80,000 a year. So order of magnitude, there, there's certainly a lot of talent that, that can be helpful when you look in other regions of the world. And in an article I was reading under Startup Genome, uh, which is a, a, an organization that works with startups, uh, their, uh, their studies show that startups that go global from day one grow up two times faster. And we're actually finding that um, exactly in the data that we have in the programs that we uh, facilitate. So some of the just very high level, some of the considerations to take while you're, um, you're considering going global, if you're a small company or a medium company that wants to expand, uh, you need to do your research. Uh, you really need to look at where you need to go. And a lot of people just, go south to the US and think it's similar, there's a lot of opportunity outside the US and outside of Canada that I think people are missing uh, in Canada. Um, the big thing is cultural awareness. Really understand um, different business cultures, uh, local cultures and, and countries. Um, it can really shorten your sales cycle. And a lot of companies uh, miss out on that. They don't take uh, into consideration uh, everything that they need to to do and, and a very quick example uh, I was working with a company that was was doing business in in Russia and they said well we're happy we signed a contract but now they want to negotiate and in some cultures that's normal sign a contract and then you negotiate we like to negotiate and then sign a contract so make sure you really understand all the little little idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasies of uh, the region you're looking at uh, for example, even Mexico is very hierarchical, so you, know, you want to make sure you're talking to the right person um, that has the authority to make the decisions. You know, in Canada, decisions can be made at, a, at, a, at, at lower levels than, than some countries. Legal and regulatory, make sure you understand sort of the rules of law, is it common law or civil law? Uh, again, foreign governments, the politics, the elections. Um, our program in, um, in Mexico was running very smooth for about six years until the government changed and it almost took us a year to get things back on track because when there's election, they review programs, they review um, uh, you know, what their policies are, they even make changes of people and, and uh, areas. So really helps to be in touch with, with the leadership, the politics, what's happening in the country. And also your business plan. What's your entrance strategy and exit strategy and how are you gonna deliver? And where do you get advice and who can assist you? There are a lot of resources, uh, certainly with Alberta Innovates if you're in Alberta, but outside of Alberta, there's a number of, of um, uh, areas of advice, uh, both with the federal government, with the trade commissioners, uh, et cetera, that can help you. So. Just a, a few little tidbits on how, what to consider going global. So a while ago, when we looked at um, when we looked at where we need to look at expanding our our global partnerships and what regions and what areas, uh, we had sourced out. Um, uh, Charles and Sheila to, to do some work for us and really look at developing a screening tool to qualify new regions for international programs. And really we started with having them focus on Southeast Asia, Asia and Latin America and really making sure that we start to at least build up a database and, and have a tool that we can use to not only help the companies we work with but look at where we may want to expand uh, and what areas, what may be some of the pitfalls or issues that companies need to take into consideration. So this is where I jump in. 
Um, so I'm just going to give you a very high level overview of the methodology that we used and, um, and what, uh, what we covered. So next slide, please. So first of all, the methodology, um, we, we used score country to score the countries in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Um, that's what we reviewed and we scored across these five countries related to their attractiveness for potential innovation partnerships with Canadian firms. So 20 points were assigned to each category so that we had a total maximum of 100 points. And as you can see here, um, the, uh, the various categories to achieve those rankings using those categories, the analytical scores were assigned subjectively based on the country's performance on the indicators um, that make up the, the five um, region, uh, categories. So then the final rankings were developed for each region to provide an overarching summary of the overall strength of the potential for each of those countries within those two regions. Uh, next slide, please. So Charles led the research here, um, uh, thank goodness, he, and got very complex. The indices that we used uh, to develop the rankings are listed here. So uh, the first uh, three that we used were innovation highlights from the Global Innovation Index and the Digital Evo uh, Evolution Index. Um, and then education and research, as you see here, um, and then business environment. And then if you jump to the next slide, you'll see the last two, which were government stability and corruption perceptions, and then corruption perceptions index. And so if you move to the next slide, we will delve into uh, the screening template results of all of that methodology. Um, meant that uh, we gathered a lot of data and so not not a screen to be reading in detail uh, but as you can see this is how everything was applied and set up splitting out between Asia and Latin America so next slide please next slide thank you so here's the top scoring countries that we identified. And um, as you can see in Latin America, it was Chile, Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. And in Asia, there were more. Uh, Singapore was by far, by far number one, uh, followed by, and as you can see in the list, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, China, Thailand, India, Vietnam, Indonesia and Philippines. So those were our top scoring. Um, I think I will just jump to the next slide because that makes most sense. Uh, so then what we realized was that uh, as Daryl mentioned about uh, social cultural indicators, he mentioned the importance of going global and of considering cultural awareness to understand business political, social idiosyncrasies and hierarchy. So we chose to use Hofstede's uh, six dimensions of national culture and the global entrepreneur entrepreneurship um, monitor, commonly known as GEM. And uh, the outputs of that were that um, we found that the most oriented towards long-term thinking and individualism were in Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, China and Singapore. And in Latin America, we found that it was Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, and Mexico. So that's how we did our methodology. I'll pass it back to you, Daryl. You have to go off mute, oh, Daryl. Sorry, I was muted, I will start over. Um, so one of the things that Charles and Sheila had, had provided was tons of data and lots of very good data on what um, uh, areas would be good indicators uh, or indicators what areas would be good for us. And one of the things that we also then needed to do is what other considerations did we need to look at. And the screening tool helped us point in different directions, uh, but we also needed to look at a few other things 
to make sure that we were um, taking all into account. And one of the things that we do in our programs is, is we use trusted partners. And partnerships that we match with our Alberta companies, for example, we know that they're not in default and we know that they, they are upstanding and, and, and um, good companies to work with because our partners in the other regions, they vet these companies and ensure that they're going to, uh, going to be good players in, in the program. And in our Jalisco program, for example, over the last 10 years, we've had two company failures, one from Jalisco, uh, which we learned lessons and we, we made that so it wouldn't happen again and one from actually from Alberta uh, later on in the program and they just run into uh, funding problems with their with their owners. But uh, so we've had really a, about a, a 98 or 99 percent success rate. So it really helps us to find the right partners to work with. Also access to resources as I mentioned before as an example in Jalisco uh, there's like 80,000 ICT grads that, that Jalisco has access to and the companies there. And so the access to resources is a key. So we wanted to make sure that the areas we're looking at had a substantial base of, uh, of ICT grads. I mean, certainly that's where that program is certain more focused. Other areas, we look at it, uh, different areas of technology that we need to understand what the infrastructure is. And also the language of business. and. Most, um, most countries certainly uh, have you know, different languages, obviously, but can a company do business in English? And in places uh, that we found in Mexico, for example, um, most of the people in business and government uh, speak English. Most of the people that are in business to business situations speak English. And uh, we had the, uh, the head of the, uh, the group that we work with in, in Mexico, he said we want people in Mexico to learn two things, he says, in, in the state of Lisco. Uh, one is, um, is coding and programming and the other is English. And so you, there has to be some synergies to, to make it easier for companies to at least work with partnerships. Uh, and also, what is the innovation ecosystem? Are they focused on being innovative and growing their, their regions uh, with innovative technology. Uh, and the last, as I noted before, what support systems are there. So we also took all the data that Charles and Sheila had put together and, and we needed to just drill down a little bit further with that. So as we went through this study and we were going through looking at areas and collecting data, um, a little thing COVID happened a little while ago uh, and kind of threw us a little bit off our plan, uh, certainly like many other companies out there. Um, and it was the big question, where do we go from here? How long is this going to last? What's going to happen? And uh, that was our big question, uh, both in Al Albert Innovates and for our, the SMEs and, and businesses that we, uh, that we work with. So one of the things that we did internally very early on in COVID, we used the McKinsey and company, a model that they come up with, sort of looking at uh, across five horizons as the pandemic hit. Um, you know, how do we, what's, what's the result? What do we do with our, in our workplace? What do we do with our customers? Uh, how do we carry on business? Um, and our resilience, <clears throat> how do we deal with sort of the bro broader resiliency issues? Um, what's going to be working? What's not working? What's shut down? What's not shut down? How do we help our, our uh, SMEs survive? And one of the things we did early on is starting to build a plan uh, within Albert Innovates to tackle these five different areas and see what do we need to do internally? How do we take care of employees and make sure they're safe? How do we roll out our company to start working at everyone to work at home? All, uh, you know, five, 600 employees that we have. How, it's fairly detailed in the sense of even from IT support and meetings and, and et cetera. And how do we then look at returning? And a lot of companies we did coaching and mentoring with some of them were looking at, how do I pivot? How do I, I can't do what I'm doing right now. How do I change and make respirators? How do I change and make PPE or 
personal protection equipment. So there was a lot of discussions with our companies and we came up with a number of different task force were set up to gather all the information across Canada, both uh, federal and provincial to see what support and how do we help our clients. And we, we probably did about um, five or six different uh, spreadsheets that we had sent out to all our, our, our clients on giving them access to different programs that may be federal or maybe provincial or that were updated. So we tried to create uh, you know, some help for them. And in talking to a lot of our clients, a lot of them were looking and saying, well, you know, in my business, I don't know if I'll be able to get back into it or the way that I had, what's the next, the new normal or the next normal? And how do I look at shifting and looking at the implications? Because I was either just looking at going global or I'm in the middle of one of Albert Innovate's programs on, on global. How do I continue to do that when other countries are shut down? For example, Mexico is, is, is reasonably restricted, travel's restricted. Uh, such things like that. So it really was, um, we really had to pivot internal and we had to work with our clients and our SMEs to help them look at ways that they might be able to pivot. <clears throat> so one of the things a little while ago, um, Adriana Huffington from the Huff Huffington Post twit twitted, <laughs> tweeted out, uh, um, uh, a little note that she wrote herself and really said nothing should go back to normal. Normal wasn't working. If we go back to the way things were, we will have lost the lessons and can we do things better? And really, you know, the way we're looking at things and working with our partners and even working with our, with our group, how do we reimagine ourselves and how do we look at uh, doing things different than before? Uh, possibly better, obviously, and and moving quicker uh, in a in a different world. Do we still have Charles? Uh, I don't oh, see. Yes. Oh, yes. Perfect. Or it took a long time to get a, to leave the room and, and come back. I think now, can you hear me? Yes. I had a lot of audio, very strange audio gremlins in our, mm. our room. And uh, half the people could hear me and half they couldn't and I couldn't hear other people anyway. So difficult for us to report out, I think, because uh, of the challenges. Maybe you guys can report out on your discussions. Yep. Del, did you want to go first? Oh, you're talking uh, mute. Okay, forget that. I never do that everywhere, anywhere else, sorry. <laughs> so we, um, we had time for really a, a couple of questions. Um, um, and really it was sort of what changes in, in the, did people see over the last while and sort of how that felt uh, maybe going forward. Uh, Kathy uh, from Whistler said that uh, um, it brought a lot of the real estate groups, the 11 different real estate groups in BC together better and more. A um, lot new level of communication, uh, also about saving uh, time, money and the environment, not having to say drive around a lot and, and do things, they were, more things were online. Um, and uh, she was saying in Whistler, they call it the green recovery. So less, uh, less spent on, on um, uh, say fuel and other, other uh, consumables. Um, also easier to, in a way, to do business with clients around the world and people to buy properties from other parts in the world. Uh, being online. Um, Megan had mentioned and talked about uh, more of a trend towards online uh, e-commerce, uh, virtual trade shows, um, you know, companies that had done market assessments to expand uh, and when the demand changed and such, uh, really determining now what makes sense. And, and I think 
very true. A lot of companies don't have the answer yet when or what they're going to do to, to say with exports or, or looking at products to other countries. Um, uh, Christine had mentioned that future is going to be a bit more high of a hybrid, uh, certainly more virtual. Um, uh, Kathy had mentioned uh, again more more dramatic changes even in in, in zoning and and real estate uh, with more um, electronic linkages to all the partners within real estate to make things go faster. Uh, there might be a lot more. Uh, changes to the way that the real estate market's going to be addressed over the next uh, few years and a lot certainly a lot more uh, online uh, before you know being uh, to, to see something I guess in real time too um, that was really a bit a bit of the summary that we had if anyone else from the group wants to make a comment certainly go ahead They've left it all to you, Daryl. <laughs> you did a great job summing it up. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll jump in then about um, uh, ours. Um, so we talked about the opportunities to reimagine. Um, and uh, Ling particularly uh, has identified that uh, the market is going to be different. Can't agree more. Um, and the, uh, the need to diversify into other markets with similar cultures and language is just more. It's, it's much greater now. Um, but going international is difficult, especially if you are trying to move into different cultures and different languages. Um, Lynn gave an example that uh, in his organization, they measure their spending. They do some other analytics uh, where they spend, uh, they measure the spending per capita, um, which we did include actually, didn't we, Charles? Um, the salary ranges and an affordability inde index, which was rather interesting. Um, and also talked about how the new normal of working at home means that um, in a number of large markets um, with people working remotely, it enables, it increases the potential for access internationally. Um, so that, uh, you know, it really is opening up more potential for us. Um, with major challenges that we're facing in looking for our global market expansion, um, it's access to money, access to that capital that we need, as well as the local resources to um, access the local delivery systems. Um, and so using um, any resources that you can, such as um, Alberta Innovates and uh, you know, similar organizations and the Canadian High Commission, can't say enough about that. Um, Matt, you mentioned about um, with COVID, with the travel restrictions, um, with uh, finding where the opportunities are, um, you recommended that uh, we leverage technologies internationally to engage and open the conduits through which we can um, access the trade services. Anything anyone in my group would like to add to that? They're leaving it all to us. So it's over to you, Charles. Yeah, and I, um, I was just going to say a couple of comments based upon your earlier and our experience uh, with, for example, the Asia Pacific Trade and Investment Specialization, which I've run in the program um, for several years. And we take a group of students to Asia. We do online learning, then we go to Asia for uh, it's been a week, and we're going to expand that uh, in the future and visit through the trade commissioner's offices, through the, the BC and Alberta trade offices, and then our own contacts, a number of companies on the ground. And there's just several things, and we mentioned those countries of focus before, and one, you know, some things that we found are, when you're looking at different countries, for example, in Asia, everyone wants to go to China, but there are more and more issues. We've stopped going to China for even some of the security reasons and, and hassles getting visas and other things that we've encountered. Um, but as well, the China market is so big and overwhelming to many firms. Um, if you do think about China, you have to think about one city, 
one market uh, there uh, in, in China rather than thinking of, of, of any kind of broader, even regional strategy because it's so large. But that's where when we've taken students to Taiwan, Korea, those markets often feel much more comfortable for Canadian firms because of the size. size. You, we've lost you again, Charles. Oh dear. So is there anything that anyone in uh, Charles's breakout session would like to add to what he was just okay. talking? I also see a comment on the chat box from Alex T uh, that he had a great experience with the Canadian Trade Commission in Houston, Dallas as well. Great group, great group of folk, uh, helpful folks. Yes, and, and I'll add to that that um, I, I access the Canadian Trade Commission um, uh, at Canada House in UK, um, which for years I'd walked past when I lived in England. Um, and um, it's very grand and uh, to go in they treat you so well and um, practically bend over backwards to help you um, with local resources and connections so can't say enough about them. Yeah, Sheila if I could just echo that uh, the experience I had in Houston actually I first <clears throat> met them at a really big conference called Gas Tech uh, which is uh, uh, you know, major uh, conference, and they had a really cool booth, actually, the big Canadian flag, and I was just drawn into it, and exactly that, they were just, you know, looking to uh, get as many contacts in your, in your, in your network as possible, and looking for linkages, and they're just like, go bend over backwards, basically, to, to do anything they can to help your business flourish, and um, it was, it's been a really great experience and it led to other connections. So I'm really glad that, that that's out there. And I, I totally advise people uh, to take advantage of that. Well said, Alex. So I'm wondering if um, we can move to, Charles was going to be talking about uh, some updates about the MBA program. Um, Charles, are you up for that? Not sure if we have him. So if you like, um, Andrea, you could, you could speak to it. Um, you probably know more about the current program than me, but I'm happy to talk to it too. It's your choice. Absolutely. I can say, maybe we could host these slides. Meanwhile, maybe we get back Charles with us. So for those that are not familiar with our Royal Roads MBA program, um, it's an executive uh, MBA. And you, as a student, have two options. You can do either in 18 months or 31 months. Uh, it's exactly the same program. It's a full, uh, it's a full-time program um, that you can complete. Meanwhile, you are working. It's exactly the same program as I will say the content and the courses. Uh, the only difference is that the in the 18 months program you will be completing two courses at a time, and the 31 months uh, it will give you more flexibility as you will be doing uh, one course at a time. Uh, some of the new program innovations is that in 2020, just because, I think Charles is back, um, just because the circumstances, we have shifted fully into our residencies um, as we normally deliver this program in a blended model, uh, we move fully into our online delivery. Um, we are also exploring in 2021. Uh, the option for students to have a choice to complete, um, oh, I think Charles is back. Let me, just one second. I've just clicked it. Charles, are you back? Not quite. Not quite yet. Uh, so as I was saying in 2021, exploring a model where students um, can choose um, for completing the program fully online or a combined um, on-campus residencies um, once it's allowed uh, for us to, to reopen the campus and offer 
those residencies and some of their online courses. Andrea, can you, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, so I can pass over to you. I'm kind of in the second, I'm just going to start talking about the option of the three days on campus. Yeah, I switched to a new computer. I don't know, something's uh, Zoom gremlin. So, uh, you know, the key thing is, uh, I just wanted to, to say for even those people who have taken the program before, and we've had to shift these residencies online. We had a little conversation about this in my, my session. In 2021, we're going to continue that where people will have the option because we're getting already people asking us, can I do this? I won't be able to travel to Victoria will I be able to do my residencies online? And the answer is yes. We intend to offer what we would call a high flex where you can do both online uh, residency or if possible, we're allowed by the province to have on campus, we'll be doing their residency on campus as well, but we will be offering both mod modalities for people uh, to, to fit people's needs. The other thing we're, we're innovating that's new in the program are these sort of three-day mini courses where um, because people, some people, for example, our August intake this year is not going to have their residency on campus, uh, for sure, that's all online. In 2021, for those students, we're looking at two or three of their online classes that they would be able to take if they want in sort of a short format on campus. So uh, that will be something that uh, we're gonna be looking at sort of instituting in the program as well, creating more opportunities and like people who are in our 31 month program who would only have two residencies that might be separated by uh, a couple of years then they're able to come back to campus uh, for some of these short experiences in between so that's that's some of the innovations we're doing another innovation that's, that's new to people uh, some of you who took the program before we've expanded our specialization so we've had these specializations in the program now for several years of management consulting and leadership, the Grenoble, we've added the Asia one a couple of years ago. Now we're expanding out where all Royal Roads graduate certificates uh, are options. And then we also have this partnership with MIT because we haven't had more technical specializations in supply chain and some of the engineering uh, areas and, and data science areas We've got specializations with these MicroMaster MOOC programs that are run by MIT and they're through their MIT X. And we can, if anyone has questions, we can talk you know, more specifically about those. The next slide has some of the grad certs. So these are just some of the graduate certificates. Royal Roads offers about 23 different graduate certificates, including project management, change management, and these are affiliated with those professional organizations executive coaching Royal Roads is well known for. I'm actually doing the coaching graduate certificate starting this fall. Um, and you can get then coaching, um, executive coaching and, and affiliation with the International Coach Federation. Um, a couple of other ones that we've seen students. So we have the first students in the program signing up for these. Corporate social innovation. So you can do more of that innovation thinking. Uh, and as well, some environmental programs like the science and policy of climate change. Uh, which is offered through our environment school, where you'll be looking in more detail, uh, both at the scientific issues behind uh, climate change, how we can make changes, and then different policy approaches. So those really expand out the, the opportunities. These are just some, some key dates, the, the, the dates the next program starts probably too soon if anyone's out there interested in terms of July 20th, so the, the application date uh, is this week, but then our next start date in January, as I say, we hope to have an on-campus residency in February, as well as an online option for anyone in that. And then next summer, we'll have another intake uh, as well. So this is just the uh, Tracy and the enrollment team there at Royal Roads, if anyone has questions uh, about that. So, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. This is, it came up in our, our sessions, you know, uh, some of our people wanted to contact us. This is our email addresses um, for contact as well. Uh, so if there's any way that uh, you want to contact us directly, I'm happy to talk not just about the program, some of the work we're doing uh, in other areas as well. I, I mostly focus my efforts on Asia, a lot of work in Mongolia, China and other places. Um, 
just wrote a chapter on Mongolia and COVID-19. So. Can, can I just add that um, way back when I did my MBA, um, I did go to, uh, I did the uh, European study tour um, uh, based in Grenoble in France. And um, Daryl and I were talking just before this event today. Um, and I believe that you were there too, Daryl. And um, we were both reminiscing about how um, transformational that was and what a wonderful experience it was. Um, and frankly, how much harder the Royal Roads uh, students, uh, learners were, were um, hard at work much more than uh, the the others but that maybe that was just a perception of what we found but um, that experience as I say was quite transformational for me. Yeah and unfortunately I was supposed to go in September this year I haven't I haven't been there I've taught several places in Europe but uh, not there so unfortunately that was cancelled uh, for this year but we're hoping it will be on again for next year. I think part of that is that smaller group and it's something we've experienced with the Asia group. So we have 10 or 15 students together with the faculty. You just get a lot more time to talk. And that's part of what the idea of adding some of these shorter intensive classes on campus would be uh, along those same lines. So that for those who are interested, these would be optional. You still could do the class online. For those who are able uh, and interested to do it, could come on campus and take a class, say, over a Friday, Saturday, Sunday with some online prep before and after, um, but it would allow you to then, you know, have this intensive face-to-face -face experience both with the other students and with your faculty as well. So those are some kind of touchstones. And we're not going to become, and some people were asking me, well, are we going to become like, you know, some of these other executive MBA programs where you come every other weekend or once a month for a week? No, it's not like that. It's that two or three, so you have your first residency, hopefully again on campus, and then your uh, second residency, and in between you would have the chance uh, to come once or twice to the campus to then uh, do some of these programs, or we go abroad, you know, with a small group. So that's sort of the vision for creating more uh, touch points within the, the program as well. While at the same time, you know, recognizing the realities is offering more online options as well, that people who uh, are, are only able to do it in the online format, we're going to offer that as well. So uh, happy to take any questions that people may have or, or uh, other comments. And I'm, I'm really sorry, I, and I never used Zoom so many times and I'd never experienced it was some weird gremlin, so I should have switched and gone to my trusty uh, Lenovo ThinkPad uh, earlier, and it would have Apple let me down, maybe. And as, oh, sorry, go ahead. Say, as Christy said, um, you can also pop questions into the, the chat box. Um, Charles, in the chat box earlier on when I was prattling on about the methodology, um, you mentioned about um, in the MBA the specializations uh, on Asia Pacific and um, uh, I wondered if you wanted to expand any uh, on that. Yeah, I, I made a couple of comments there. One was about, so, so part of, uh, it, and I don't know if there's anyone on, online who took my class in the last few years. I've I teach the international global political economy and international trade area. And I have each person sort of choose a country and then follow that country so that they can see how issues like trade agreements, um, trade barriers, a, a, a lot of different engaging the types of products and things uh, that they're engaging, the resources they have and that they can bring to the global political economy. Uh, and some of the things we found is on, on government stability, corruption, those areas affect different countries in their sort of business environment. So that's something that we've been doing and it, it's been illuminating to me because when we have, we have the classes just kicked off in the program, 60 students in there uh, choosing different countries. So you see this wide range of countries across the world and, and, and get a good feel and, and interesting discussions that come up among people uh, in, in that context. So that's one thing that, that we've done. Uh, the other is then I, I've taught 
both the online portion and then taking groups of students to Asia. And in the Asia Pacific uh, area, we tried to look, of course, Asia is huge, several billion people and, and dozens of countries. We focus more on East Asia, partly because of my background, the background of the other teachers, Hugh Stevens and, and Jeff Kucharski, who've been teaching with, with me in that uh, we're all a bit more focused on China, Japan, South Korea, and the East Asian countries. And for travel reasons as well, it's been easier in some ways to travel to those, those areas. So we've taken groups of students to uh, Seoul several times, to Shanghai, to Taiwan, to Hong Kong, Shenzhen in Southern China. And we meet with some really interesting, we've been to the Alibaba campus, we've gone to uh, uh, the uh, campuses of several of the large Chinese uh, company, you know, trick question, but you know, what's the largest electric car company in the world? It's certainly not Tesla, it's BYD uh, in Shenzhen in China, build your dream. So, which had a partnership, I'm not sure what it's the status in, in Ontario, they were going to have electric buses and looking at, at Vancouver as well. So we go to, we went to the factory, we went and met with the companies there, a lot of really interesting partnerships uh, that were going on. Things are strained, as I say, with, with China in particular right now. Uh, we had some government, people who work for the federal government, who it wasn't that they were directly sort of blocked from going to China, but there were concerns about their travel to China in a, in a civilian capacity when they had official positions in the government. So we've moved away right now, at least from visiting China. This last year, we were going to Tokyo and Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, in part because we met with uh, Canadian Tire and their foreign procurement uh, division and really learned about what they've been working on, why they stay in China. They would like to move more production out of China. Um, they are moving some to Vietnam. So we were going to explore that uh, when we went to Vietnam. Um, unfortunately, that trip got canceled, but uh, we did have a number of talks with people at factories and things in Vietnam, but the capacity isn't quite there in other countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, India. So you can't easily move your production out of China. They have so many advantages in terms of scale, infrastructure, uh, the, the rising technology level there, quality levels. So you learn a lot on the ground. It's been very illuminating to be there and be on the ground uh, in Asia. And so that experience of taking groups of students over uh, has been fantastic. And in the program, we have such a diverse set of people. So we've had, as I say, people from different governments. We had people from Alberta and their agricultural exports. Uh, we had people in the federal government. We had people with companies, technology, looking at cloud computing, looking at uh, uh, different trade uh, possibilities, different um, one with cosmetics and, and different things. So then the conversations that go on among that group and thinking about different opportunities and challenges uh, has been really fantastic. So uh, that is something, uh, again, that we want to continue in the future. I think these international, I, I'm very much about international opportunities and looking for ways that we can build those connections and opportunities between the program um, and other schools and other uh, countries and companies, because I think that, and unfortunately in the days of COVID, uh, you know, it, it is very hard. You, you can get a lot from, talking with people. We bring in the trade commissioners from on the ground in Chandigarh, India, and talk with them about their experience. But of course, to be in Chandigarh would be a very different experience and just get a much richer uh, feel. So we uh, uh, will we'll do our best uh, in the international space for the time being, and then hope we all will be able to travel again soon. Okay. Andrea. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Sheila and Dylan. Uh, thank you so much for all your support and for being here today. Um, I have been, I'm just curious to know if anyone has any final questions or comments, feel free to type it on the chat, or maybe right now is a good time for unmuting your microphone and just share any final thoughts with us if you have some. And as you said, uh, Charles, um, if you have any questions, feel free to connect with our Royal Roads team. And, 
I think so. Oh, I see. Yeah, thank you, messages. Great presentation. Thank you, Kathy, for here, be here. So thank you, everyone, for spending the last hour and a bit with us and coming here to learn more about the new opportunities for the Canadian markets and how uh, through organizations as um, Alberta Innovates, uh, you can expand those opportunities and, and, and just connect. I think some of the lessons in some of these COVID and before even the COVID is how we connect each other, how we seek for new opportunities and how we as a community come together and innovate and try to check our ways of doing and, and find new ways of uh, creating new opportunities for that, all of us. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you in the near future.